So we've got another big treat in store, Bill Hazeltine, an icon, a legend, a, uh, uh, a person who has been involved in a moonshot and uh, project and succeeded. So I'm bringing back Larry Steinman from Palo Alto and Stanford to uh, introduce Bill and we're gonna have a panel discussion or not a panel, but we're gonna, we're gonna be talking to Bill and uh, taking advantage of some of his experience and wisdom accumulated over the years. Over to you, Larry. Uh, thank you, Zan, and uh, good morning to you, Bill. Uh, in introducing Bill, I, I wanted to uh, just riff uh, for a minute or two about the word moonshot. So uh, Bill uh, grew up at China Lake Naval Air Station. His father is a scientist, his siblings are a scientist, so uh, although they didn't have a moonshot from China Lake Naval Air Station, other uh, famous things were done nearby at Edwards Air Force Base, breaking the sound barrier, that type of thing. But uh, the technology that went into the moonshot uh, owes a lot to uh, Bill's father. So uh, this morning I mapped uh, how far uh, Bill's high school was from the edge, uh, from one of the labs at China Lake Naval Air Station, it's 1.2 miles walking. I don't know if Bill walked to school, we'll find out. Uh, when Bill got to Berkeley, and uh, we don't like to praise Berkeley too much from Stanford, <laughs> but I shall, um, he wrote a paper in Science about uh, the atmosphere of uh, Mars, uh, finding a lot of uh, deuterium, deuterated uh, water there. So. Uh, that's more than a moonshot. It's a planetary shot. But let me just uh, go on a little bit. At Berkeley, uh, it may be an easier school. Uh, Bill <laughs> majored in chemistry and he ended up as valedictorian. He then went on to Harvard, uh, tagged around with uh, Jim Watson and Wally Gilbert, and uh, got deeply into molecular biology. At the same time, those were tumultuous years in uh, Boston and Cambridge, and he was uh, very active in uh, the Vietnam uh, War uh, reaction among uh, students who were not in the combat theater of operation, uh, and then went on to a fabulous career, first in academia. He was, uh, went to David Baltimore's lab, worked on retroviruses, started a few companies that became uh, big players, uh, aside from the biggest company that he uh, was involved with as CNO and founding chairman of uh, Human Genome Sciences, which transformed a lot of what we do using uh, genomic studies. And they actually produced the first therapeutic uh, breakthrough in lupus. Since uh, that time, uh, Bill has done so many things. One is uh, in the area of uh, health uh, care with, uh, we'll find out from him about more about access, but he's also been intensely interested in longevity. And uh, he's written articles and uh, co-written books about longevity with dignity. So I'm supposed to ask questions and not take up too much of uh, Bill's airtime. So I have to start out with a question uh, could you tell us about access healthcare and, and what access is, and then just give us your thoughts about uh, what we should be doing in the area of longevity, Bill? Well, thank you very much. Um, it was a very generous introduction. And uh, the answer was I did do that walk uh, from high school and they had a wonderful program where from sophomore years on, you could work in the laboratory. And uh, I had the great privilege of uh, working with some of the scientists. I would, after school, walk over, ride my bike. Uh, when I was a senior, I actually got to drive. I use a family car and drive over there, the whole one, one and a half miles. Um, but uh, the, the work there was really fascinating. I was working particularly with one scientist who was the first one to work on uh, uh, benzopyrene spirans, which change uh, flip colors depending on uh, UV light. So if you go out in the sun, they turn dark, and that's where your gla dark glasses might come from. And that was really fun. That was high school work. Uh, and it was, of course, a very enriched uh, atmosphere. 
it was a combination of ace pilots, people had shot down five others, by the way, that's a pretty bloody but very interesting group of people. Uh, all the test pilots when I was kids, they were all my dad's, uh, all, my, all my friend's dads. And later, um, all the scientists, it was just a very enriched uh, atmosphere, sort of enclosed in a desert valley, um, beautiful, really, you know, it was wonderful for nature. Just very free. You just walk out, do what you want. So it was a very nice environment. But um, let me sort of, I had decided, uh, I didn't actually like the war theme of China Lake and then made a decision very early on, uh, mostly because my mother was very ill for most of my uh, growing up, that I should do something to help humanity. I didn't think it was fair for people to be so ill. And so I decided to devote my career to health. But because I came from, and I think it's important to say, I came from a very unusual environment, a military base in the middle of the desert, where if you drop a bomb and miss by 50 miles, it doesn't kill anybody, is an unusual place to grow up. Uh, and when you do that, there's, there's no normal life around you. It's, everything is military. Everything is organized. Uh, it's the ultimate uh, socialist institution. Everything is provided by the government. It's amazing to me that military people on the whole are so conservative and they grow up in a socialist and totally socialist environment. Uh, but that, that is, everybody knows, pretty much the case. But what it does is it gives you almost an immigrant's view of America. You have to look at what is there because you didn't know what's there. It's not ingrained in you. The, the things that you see outside, you have to try to form some kind of formal process. And that helped me understand the role of institutions. The institutions are our greatest tool. If you actually think about an institution, think of the church. It's a very, very old institution. It has a very specific social purpose. Or our universities, our oldest institutions, along with the church. They serve very particular purposes. And rather than identifying myself with an institution, I understood them as tools for a purpose. And I think that's something that's a really important thing to think about for young people. Most people would just say, I'm part of this institution, whether it's a company, a university, and that's it. No, I thought a university is a tool to create new knowledge and apply it for social good. A company, a big company has market reach. A small company is to take good ideas, new ideas that big companies won't do and show that they're feasible. And it wasn't at that time possible, for example, to set up a big institution like the Broad Institution today or a series of them. You just didn't have multi-billion dollar institutions who were part not university and part universities, you do today. And so what I, the, my whole goal was to try to improve human health. The series was first through science, then through application of science to medicine, then through biotech companies, and finally through not-for-profit organizations. But I also took a look at the international organizations, WHO, uh, all the international, and I, I saw them as so heavily politicized that it would be very difficult to operate in those environments. And that's why I decided to create my own institution. And I had a couple of very interesting models. The Brookings Institution, which was set up to change government policy or influence American government policy across a range of activities for the better. And a very interesting institution I became very close to called the Alaska Foundation, which is responsible for much of the structure of the National Institutes of Health today from a very small foundation. They created a impression of size and importance through the Oscar Awards and social connections, but they used their money to actually write the legislation for many of our institutions. And I thought that is a very good model where a small foundation can make a big difference. And the area that I thought needed to be changed is, I understood from genomics and all the work I'd done before, there was tremendous possibilities to create new drugs and new ways to treat disease but there were such blatant inequities in the United States and around the world that I thought there has to be a better way to organize healthcare. So I started looking around the world. That was the first mission of Access Health to find the best examples I could find. One of them was Singapore and I wrote a book on Singapore. They give 
amongst the best healthcare in the world at 5% of their GDP. Think of that compared to what we do. We're about 32nd in the world for GDP, uh, for health outcomes. And we spend twice or three times as well. We spend a lot more than 5% of our GDP. So I wrote a book on how they did it. And it's really interesting to see that it can be done. It's proof of principle. Now, whether most people want to apply that principle is another matter. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, when I handed him the book, said, well, this is very interesting, Bill. What makes you think people want to change? <laughs> so that was his uh, pithy comment. And it was a deep comment, actually, not just a joke. It was a deep comment. But then I went on to study uh, ambulance care, emergency care in India, where one organization for free picks up, uh, serves uh, 850 million people. Ambulance costs 15 Dollars and in 20 minutes, no matter what, not to you, it's free. It's actually a real pickup. How you can use modern information to rationalize emergency care. It's amazing what you can do. And then I wrote a book on NYU Langone because it's a, a very interesting case study of how an American institution, academic institution, can pull itself up by the bootstraps for being very mediocre bottom third in quality and safety, 40th in medical school, going bankrupt, not a good, good sign, to being rated number two medical school in the United States, a surprise for many, uh, number one in NIH grants per, pay, uh, per, per researcher, a uh, billion dollars plus profit per year, which you may agree with or not, it's not called profit, they call it surplus. Um, and so the question is, how do you take those lessons? And it's and help governments that want to do something to improve their situation. And that's what I do with XS Health. We work around the world. We find the best examples. And we work on a diverse uh, area. One of the other principles I learned just from observing is that the way that most not-for-profits are organized in the United States to help other countries or work with other countries spends a lot of money here, a lot of money on travel, and by the time you get to the results of the country, it's de minimis. That's true of many, many programs. And uh, I didn't like that. So everybody who works for me in China, in Singapore, in India, wherever I, we work, Philippines, are from that country. And we have a very minimal overhead. To manage that, I have maybe two people, two and a half people in the United States. And uh, everything else is abroad. So I'm now building on my unit in the United States to work on issues of uh, pandemic control. But uh, that's uh, what Access Health is. But it was really came from the desire and a series of desires where I realized that science was good, that business could turn science into marvelous new cures, but most of those wouldn't get to most people in our country and around the world. It's a long answer to a short question. Well, well I, I loved it, Bill, and I, I just, I'm quite struck by your principle of just a small organization or even a few people catalyzing great change. It, it makes me think of the Margaret Mead quote about uh, only a few individuals are needed to make a major change and in effect, that's uh, what always has been the case. Um, and then what's interesting about that is it's true, but you have to, the, the, the trick is to find the people that realize I need to make the change. Yes. Well, that's and what one I'm, thing you've learned I'm and I've learned is you cannot put an idea into somebody else's head. Yeah. You can't convince any, they have to be 90% of the way. And you've got to find those situations where people are ready and know they need help. Yeah, and I, I left out the key word uh, of her quote, that the people are committed. Uh, that's what it takes, committed people mm -hmm. uh, who can make the difference. And, and certainly you are walking that talk. You, it's just an individual. And then the organizations that you have forged are doing that. I'm wondering um, what you might identify as other uh, potential catalyt catalytic uh, units that might be uh, a solution to the kind of problems that we're describing in this conference? Um, 
Well, you know, we've seen, uh, let's take a character like Elon Musk. Uh, he is one of the more remarkable characters of our time, without a doubt. He has pioneered private space exploration and done it better than governments, any government that has seen. And he's made a huge difference to transportation. I now have, I don't have a, uh, a, a, uh, uh, whatever his cars are called. Uh, uh, but I have a uh, Porsche, which uses his guts <laughs> in the car, okay? So yeah. you used his, uh, it's not a Tesla, but he uses his battery and his, and his yeah. motors. And it goes like a bat out of hell and is a fantastic car. Yeah. And I never, never go to a gas station. I just plug it into the wall socket. So he's made a huge difference. And a person like that, he has a very different trajectory from mine, but it's a kind of a person it has a great vision and the ability to organize it. And I think one of the key things that you realize uh, about America and some, a few other countries is our capital structure. Most people, you know, you call yourself a self-made person. It's not that. Society has the capability. And one thing I realized very early on, and you have to realize I had no idea about business. You know, I thought business was selling shoes outside the base, okay? That was it. That's my experience with business. Nobody had any business experience. And if they did, it's, oh, that's very dangerous, very risky. Don't do it. If you have a nice government job, just stay there. But um, uh, the way our capital structure is organized to take ideas, uh, put risk capital in, and then organize that so it interfaces with our capital markets is an amazing phenomenon. And I think there are very few countries. Nobody does it as well as we do. Britain does it okay. Scandinavian countries are okay. Israel is okay. And that's about it. You know, I've been, I've been an advisor to many governments to try to help them do that. I remember the Minister of Finance of Germany coming to say, we're going to be number one in biotechnology. We're going to give everybody as much money as they need, $4 to one. And you know what I told them? You're putting manure on rocks. <laughs> You're going to get green shoots and they all die. Guess what happened? They put manure on rocks and they got green shoots and they all died. He wasn't well, happy with my comment, but uh, they didn't have a capital market. They didn't have the, 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 energy, the, the, the energy to do that. Bill, Bill, building on a couple of your ideas, and just to be a little contrarian, uh, and speaking of shots in the arm, that the shot in my arm came from uh, the work of many scientists but particularly an immigrant uh, from Turkey to Germany who started a biotech company about cancer and parlayed that into BioNTech. Mm -hmm. and it all emerges right. that uh, led to the shot in billions of arms, billions of shots anyway. Yeah. Well, so, Germany is not complete failure, but so, it yeah, isn't a rival to the US in but, biotech. But, but to, to get us to the, the subject of longevity, every morning I wake up and I look at my email and I uh, say, what can I learn from Bill Hazeltine about COVID? So I want to flip the question a little bit to what do I learn from Bill Hazeltine about COVID applied to longevity? So here's the question. I remind myself I'm supposed to ask questions. So the elderly at the beginning of the pandemic were notably susceptible. Uh, the children were notably resistant. And it seems to me, and tell me if this is right, but I wanna know what lessons are learned. It was the elderly populations that uh, were uh, among the first and best at getting themselves immunized, and whether it was in a nursing home or elsewhere, with certain geographic exceptions. What lessons can that tell us about longevity and what we should do to help elderly live with dignity? I think that you've asked a series of really interesting questions. And um, I'm trying to think about a best way to answer those. Let me give you just some recent data that came across my desk this morning. It's an analysis of who ends up in the hospital today. And if you are under five, you've got an unvaccinated, you have a much lower chance of ending up in the hospital than if you're over 65 and vaccinated. Think about that for a minute. 
Okay. So what does that tell you? And I've been, the last three months, I've been really digging deeply into the relationship between our viral defenses and the virus's counter strategies. And I've written about 15, 16 pieces on that now, and I'm still going. It's a very intricate, intricate dance. It's been developed over tens of uh, many millions of years where we fight virus and the viruses adapt to us. And what you see from that is that those people that are susceptible to serious disease and death fall into very well-defined groups. They are older or they have an immune deficiency by inheritance or acquired, or they're inflamed because they're obese or they have diabetes. It's a very clear group. And the younger you are, the more able and more, less likely you are to get serious disease. And what that's reflecting, I think, is innate immunity and how well it works versus uh, it's really your innate immune system that's active in repressing the virus. And if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, a young child has not had the experience of being infected by many things. So they need to have a very strong innate immune system to fight off whatever's coming in. And they do. And there's some new papers coming out that are showing how powerful the innate immune response is in younger people. As you get older, that response fades. And the older you get, the, the more less likely it is. Still, even in advanced age, you are pretty good because only about one and a half percent to 2% die of this. So your, your body is fighting in a number of ways what the virus is doing. And when you analyze the virus in detail, it's got half of its metabolic energy or more is devoted and its genes are devoted to shutting down the innate immune system. That's what it does. But if your body can't make the interferons or can't make the genes that come that are induced by interferons for one reason or another, you have very serious trouble. How does that map onto aging? Well, um, it maps onto aging because if you cannot make all of these uh, immune responses, not only are you susceptible to disease, but it's a fundamental dysregulation of your inflammatory process. And that is becoming more and more a constant theme about Alzheimer's. And there's some very direct connections between some of the genes involved in the innate immune response. For example, uh, 2,5-A um, uh, synthetase uh, and Alzheimer's. The same genes that make you susceptible, same alleles that make you susceptible to uh, COVID confer susceptibility to Alzheimer's as well. That's a, it's about inflammation. It's in, the, in this case, what's going on in the microglial cells. So there are connections you can make, and I'm trying to explore that and learn more in detail about that. But let me just take a, another step back. Um, is it possible through our understanding of human biology that we will one day be able to extend life dramatically? And many years ago now, 20 years ago plus, I uh, created the term regenerative medicine. And the term was meant to say any medical intervention. I was trying to explain to a group of non-scientists what modern medicine was going to do. Gene therapy, uh, altering gene structures, which turned out to be CRISPR. Uh, I actually predicted that we'd be able to reset the genetic clock because that's what happens with every child. And five years later, Yamanaka did it. Um, and, and we were working with genes that reorganize. You know, one thing that uh, Danny Hillis said to me, he said, I was giving a talk, I said, you know, we put one gene into a mouse muscle and we build a whole vascular network. You know, where's the information for that, Bill? If I change a line in my computer code, I don't change the whole damn thing, okay? So there's gotta be a lot of information. And that was a deep question because we are not dealing with all the information. When we think we know the genome as a tiny piece of the total information that's in cells. I remember an experiment in high school where we dissociated a frog kidney and all of a sudden the next morning, all the cells blown back together, right? Where is all that information? It's, it's a really deep question. And so the question is, can we with iPS cells, with genes, with anything else, reset our own genetic clock? 
And there's one good example where we do. We make age hybrids when we do a bone marrow transplant. That's an age hybrid. Usually it's a younger stem cell and an older body. Will we do that for many other tissues? Probably we can. Will we be able to do it for the brain? That's my big question. Probably regenerative medicine through a combination of genes, proteins, biomechanical prosthetics, like my glasses or metal or something else, is going to make our bodies a lot better for a lot longer. How long? I don't know. But maybe we'll even be able to regenerate our tissues. The problem is the brain. Despite all the hoopla 20 years ago about brain stem cells re replacing the brain, it doesn't really happen. That's sort of, the, the, it replaces your olfactory lobe. You're very lucky that there's one part of your body, your brain that does regenerate and that's your olfactory bulbs. It isn't your eye, it may be a few hair cells in your ear actually, but it's very limited replacement. And that even begs the question, if I am able to put new cells into my brain, are they gonna be me? And are they gonna have my memories? Are they gonna have the same connections? So we may, and I think it's very possible through a combination of many different technologies, extend our body's life. Whether we're gonna extend our brain's life is the question, maybe not for our generation, but for the future. Right now, our generation is learning how, and it is really still very simple. Let me just give you an, an example. We were very optimistic 22 years ago that we'd have a blood vessel for implantation very quickly. We don't have it today. There were people who were proposing to build whole new hearts. If you can't build a blood vessel, how could you build a new heart? There is one good example now. Actually, there are three. You can build a urethra, you can build a bladder, and now you can build a vagina that works. And that's after six years of implantation. You see women saying, this organ, new organ that I didn't have, now it's functional. I'm having a happy married life. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing you can do, and it actually shows you and it's a lesson for all of us in, who've been in science. We get the ideas, we're so enthusiastic, and then it looks like it's never gonna work. And then finally, we get to some place where it kind of works for some things. And over time, it may work for a lot of things. I've gone through that cycle, for example, with immunology and cancer. You know, I went to the Dana-Farber in the early days, in 1976, and Baruch and all the people there were really keen on immunology is gonna solve cancer. And it goes, as you well know, further, much further back than that. But they had some good ideas. Well, guess what? Today, 30 years later, 40 years later, it is solving a lot of cancers. But it takes a long, long time. So my answer to you on the aging is, yeah, we're going to make great progress on the body. Let's hope we learn enough about the mind to make great progress there, too. So let me uh, make an observation and then uh, ask a question, because I want to uh, go from uh, subjects like immunology to uh, social science. The observation is uh, just about your comment about the innate immune system. So the elderly in Wuhan who had asthma did better than uh, expected and better than people who didn't. Children with asthma are also notably even more resistant than they already are. That seems to be uh, holding up. So I'm a, a big proponent of that. But let's switch to social sciences uh, for a while. I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, maybe you do, or maybe the field does or doesn't. Were the elderly populations more successful in their rates of getting immunized than others like the 20-year-olds, the as the uh, rumor goes? Uh, they feel so darn healthy, and they want to go uh, party. Uh, that they, they don't feel that great need. But the elderly uh, was an imperative and there were government programs to make sure that nursing home personnel and nursing home residents got, is there a, a general idea that the elderly got organized better to fight the pandemic than the rest of the population? The, the, the numbers show that the elderly, let's say people over 50, uh, are much more thoroughly immunized than younger people. But there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that the first vaccines were only approved for people 65 and up. The EUA did not allow people to be, so you couldn't even, you couldn't get vaccinated unless you had a friend. If you were younger than that, it was very difficult to, to, to get. 
Uh, and the second is, is generally general messaging is, is certainly from the beginning of the epidemic that uh, the elderly were most at risk, which is accurate messaging. However, that there's now a realization that there is serious disease, particularly long COVID amongst younger people uh, that we have to take into effect. And it's still a little bit too early to understand all the consequences of long COVID. I will tell you one thing that is now uh, emerging, and that is in those people who've had COVID, whether it's mild or severe, who have reported uh, and, and have serious mental issues, which show up on standard neurological exams, memory, uh, attention, deficits. In fact, many of them so severe they can't work. Uh, they have markers in their blood which look like they've had severe Alzheimer's. There is something that has happened to them that's real and powerful, and there's been a lot of nerve damage. Now, it isn't the virus in pervading the brain. It's much more likely a secondary effect of vascular, uh, microvascular uh, inflammation. Uh, and many of the neurons are proximal to microcapillaries. And if those are inflamed, and there is a lot of work now on endothelial infection. Uh, and one, one really interesting thing I've just come across is that interferon induces ACE2 in endothelial cells. And so the very fact that you're beginning to fight the virus and the interferon triggers all that is also one of the reasons you get inflamed. You're, you get pan uh, vasculitis uh, from this. And it's a, it's a dreadful uh, thing that uh, happens to you. But um, I think it's a, it's a combination of epidemiology, messaging, and I don't necessarily know that it's the experience of age that tells you to get vaccinated. I think it's, it's a more of a, a public messaging and availability um, of the vaccines. Maybe it's seeing a number of your fellows die, but that hasn't seemed to help the Southerners in the Republican Southerners. They well, Bill, saw their Bill. fellows die and they're still not getting vaccinated. So <laughs> no matter what there is, I don't know if that's the right, I don't think watching your fellow die is necessarily your friend's die is necessarily the right message or the review yeah. that way. Bill, to your point about the strengths of the U.S. <laughs> system, uh, the rugged individualism uh, that attracts uh, Elon Musk also has its downside. Uh, we in the U.S. have the worst vaccination record among all develop or developed countries and even uh, developing countries um, compared. So what do we do about that? What, um, and I'm not asking you for a political solution here. I, I'm just, uh, as you look for the, um, the outliers that teach us, how do we uh, face this enormous challenge of being resistant to uh, uh, science and uh, people who report science? Um. You can't separate that from politics because in America it became political and the anti-vax, you know, it, it, there's such dichotomies in the way people approach this. Yeah, I'm going to take a monoclonal antibody if I'm exposed, but I'm not going to take a vaccine, right? That is from any logical point of view, not sensible. Uh, however, that is a real point of view that people have. Um, and so, I think that the best response the government can make is mandates. And they do seem to work. And certainly in other countries like France, they work very well. And where the numbers that I'm seeing take big hospital systems, they may be a half a percent of people who are so resistant. And they're not minority, by the way. That is very, you know, at first, I'll give you one example here in Connecticut. Uh, one of the big systems here, there was, 30,000 plus people. At the beginning, 5,000 said they weren't going to get vaccinated. And that was very heavily Black and Hispanic. Almost all the Black and Hispanic population got vaccinated. And now there are about 500 people they're going to let go uh, who are mostly not Black and Hispanic. So um, it really works. The mandates really work to get people vaccinated. Uh, and in France, it just shot through the roof. Italy shot through the roof 
once people um, uh, couldn't go to restaurants, couldn't go to movie theaters. And now in Israel, they're demanding a uh, the, uh, three shots to be able to have what you would say is normal uh, movement. Um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated question, what's vaccinated? Uh, in the United States, if you have an adenovirus vaccine and then a Pfizer vaccine or mRNA vaccine, you're not considered vaccinated. That's something I just learned this morning. I was very surprised by that. Uh, and so what is, and I, you know, I've been, you know, I've been in talks with people in the administration and the question is, are we gonna change the definition of vaccinated now that we need a third dose? No, I and the question is not yet, but maybe it will be. So it's going to be a rolling definition. And why doesn't that happen with influenza or anything else? And then another question is, why do we, why do we talk about who made our vaccines? Who made your influenza vaccine that you took this year and last year and the year before? Who knows, right? You go to your pharmacy, you get a shot. And who cares? Can you travel if you've been vaccinated for flu? Yes. Do you know if you've not been vaccinated for flu? Yes. The people I see with me are old enough to remember when you had to show your yellow card, right? You had to be smallpox vaccinated. If you go to certain parts of the world, you have to be yellow fever vaccinated, um, polio vaccinated, uh, all sorts of vaccines. So, but it is a, it is a very, very difficult question, but I think it's, it falls into the political realm and the only way we can address it is mandates vaccine mandates. And those are all, you know, how many mandates do we already have for vaccines? You know, I've got a daughter who was going to NYU and she had to be, and then did some work in the medical center and volunteer work. She had to be vaccinated for almost everything you can possibly imagine, right? Did she like it? No. Did she do it? She had to. Bill, I think what, one of the things that you provide such a great service is educating uh, us scientists. And the last time I read the Bill of Rights, I didn't see that there was a right to be stupid in the United States, but it, apparently it's a, uh, they might add that on to the Bill you of know, Rights. No, they're not stupid. Well, it, that, it's, that's, 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 it, it, it's a much deeper thing than that. And if you call them stupid, you're gonna lose ground. Um, well, you know, there's a number of books that I've read now you know, they're sort of in the genre of hillbilly elegy, trying to show you how the poor white people in America think. Now, well, my view is they've been bamboozled. They've been dangled lifestyle evangelistic goodies in respect to allow other people not to pay their taxes. That's how I see our political system on the right. It's basically a trade-off. We'll give you lifestyle things that you think you want. And you're able to suppress your woman because you've, you've lost your idea of what a man is. You've done all sorts of things. We'll give you all that. But you've got to keep voting us in office so we don't have to pay tax. I, I think it's important, though, for the, uh, we who are in science and medical science to do some more education to uh, counter the motif in hillbilly elegy. The, the hillbilly elegy, these are people who walk around with very smart phones and they are very smart and they use their phones uh, well. Uh, so they know science uh, quite well. They can fix stuff. Uh, a lot of us intellectuals aren't very good at fixing stuff uh, because we don't work with our, our hands that well. But my point is, when I, I, I heard on the radio uh, hospital in the Ozark, somebody saying, well, if I get sick, I'll take a monoclonal, which is interesting. Uh, prices are very different, but the essential fact is that we who are immunologists have not taught the world something very important about the difference between a vaccine, which teaches our immune system to give us powerful immunity. It might wane for this vaccine, but it can be boosted versus a monoclonal, which is passive. Once that wears off, where's your immunity? Well, you could say with, with these vaccines, that wanes too. Well, so, yeah. That's but, not necessarily the best, the best answer, but, but let, me, let me address your question, John. There are two. Uh, about more than One anything. is that we do a very poor job of educating most people about science or anything else. Uh, our education system is broken. 
And that is partly a problem of democratic politics, because in our lifetimes, the public education system has become unionized, has become self-servant. And I dealt with it personally with my own kids and saw how the system just degraded over time because the jobs are mostly uh, union sinecures for incompetence. That's a pretty harsh statement about our public education system, but I don't think it's inaccurate. A lot of people, maybe even the majority are there as relatives, nepotism, sinecures for a corrupt system which is over unionized. And they are the backbone of the Democratic Party. So it's both parties, the lack of education is really dreadful. And I was educated completely in public education. So I got to graduate school. I was a, a you know an impacted area, federally educated kid from a Navy base. And then I went to Berkeley for free, for free, <laughs> okay? Until Ronald Reagan came in, it was free. It was fantastic. So I really tried to put my kids through the public education system and saw a systematic effort to degrade it. It wasn't just neutral. If there was a good school, they tried to bring it down and they did. And so uh, the fundamental problem is what we need to do is improve our education system. And there's so that is a huge problem, as we all know. But um, there's another problem, and who is it that best educates? I'm gonna give you a, a case in point. You may remember that in Switzerland, they were gonna vote for recombinant DNA or not. Mm -hmm. And when they had the scientists out there in front, it went from something like 50-50 to 70% against. I remember driving through the fields and farmers would arrange their bales, N-O-N, in big farmer's bales, right? Then a friend of mine got hired, a, a PR person, and then turned it around. Once the scientists stopped talking and they had professional communicators talk, it went 70% the other way. We don't talk to people in a way that they like to hear. That's right? a great it's not, point. It's not, you know, our thought process, we're so deeply trained in an analytical fact-based thought yeah. process and a, uh, a world in which there's no certainty. There are only theories as best we can get. Right. And, you know, a theory never holds up with time or almost never holds up with time. It's not a fact. We don't have facts. We have repeatable observations. That, and, and what Linus Pauling said, I'll leave what I believe what the facts allow. You can speculate however you want. That's how we think. That isn't how most normal people think. And I've had to learn through painful experience that questioning everything anybody says at a dinner party isn't the most popular <laughs> response. So our, our, our way of communicating isn't a good way for most people. How, how do you explain the exceptions, though, in the political system? As the Civil War was approaching, Abraham Lincoln set up the land-grant universities. He established the National Academy of Sciences. He had other stuff on his mind, but somehow uh, he thought education and science were important. More recently, our then-adversaries, uh, the Russians, launched Sputnik. That set a tremendous revolution in American science education. Maybe we need more kicks in the rear end. Well, you know, maybe uh, COVID will be that. And I, it, you may know I've written a book for kids called Science is a Superpower. It's a great And book. I talk to high school kids now, but I think there has to be a whole genre. There has to be a whole movement. Like every door was open to me as a young person, as a scientist, through Sputnik. It really just changed all our science curricula. Our science books all of a sudden changed. There were programs to support young people. They just changed now. You know, there's a, another very interesting theme that maybe you haven't asked me about, but I think it's really worth talking about. How science, investment in science leads to solutions. And I was thinking about that. And if you actually think about, I've been involved in three major revolutions. One how, or two pandemics and one revolution. One of those was HIV. Now it's COVID. And in the meantime, in the inner interregnum, it was um, genomics. Those have changed in some very fundamental ways. But each one of those, when you trace when I trace it back, is benefited from a very deep long-term investment in fundamental science. If there hadn't been that investment, for example, we could work on HIV because we had the special virus cancer program. And that is what gave rise to recombinant DNA and all these businesses we have today. And also a very deep understanding of viruses and retroviruses in particular. 
when we look at the revolution, the genomics revolution, it was three things in combination. It was the ability to rapidly sequence DNA, which was a fundamental. Remember that was started not by the NIH. It was started in, it was started by Pete Domenici who wanted to create jobs in New Mexico. Big science is us. And then the NIH said, no, no, genes are us. So it sort of had a, a dual existence. That was a fundamental investment and a pretty one, big one for the time. Then there was the revolution in computer science, which just was allowed you to you to take large amounts of information. And you know, there's, when you look at the amount of genomic information, it's like a spy satellite it collects huge amounts of information, and then you got to make sense of it. And it was laboratory automation. Those three things came together to make genomics possible. And then if you think about COVID, it's really all the investment, the two and a half, three billion dollars we put into HIV research. It actually made COVID manageable and quick. And almost, I would say at least half the scientists that are the leaders in uh, COVID research are former HIV researchers or still are HIV researchers. And it almost maps perfectly. And for example, why were we able to do the vaccine trial so darn rapidly? Because we used the NIH HIV vaccine network, which is a global network. How do you, how in heck, think of a clinical trial you may have been involved in. How in heck do you get 30,000 people in 20 different countries in six months? That was done because the administrative structure was there through all of these decades of investment in what has turned out to be not so productive, but certainly interesting, HIV vaccine research. So sure. it's, it, it builds on itself. And that's a, that's a very positive message. Fundamental research pays off in really important ways. And I think that's a message that we have to think about for any topic, the topic you're interested in, which is metabesity and, uh, and longevity or any of these, these fields, it's really important. Well, Bill, coming back uh, to the kick in the pants of the pandemic, maybe that is our spot. Maybe this is our wake up call to make lemon aid out of lemons and to do a lot of different things that uh, would not otherwise have happened nearly as rapidly. Well, we're also lucky. You're right in a sense, and let's hope so. But we're also lucky we have a president that really respects and understands as much as a non-scientist can the importance of biomedical research. I remember 35, 40 years ago being at scientific conferences with Joe Biden, who's then senator. And he's always been interested in this. And it's, I don't think it's by chance that he has appointed the first uh, cabinet level official who's a scientist. I mean, that's every, uh, and a pretty good one too. Okay, <laughs> he, he's a very good person to have that job. He's got sharp elbows and a sharp mind. Okay, and you need that in Washington. You need good, sharp elbows, and he's got a great mind, and he has a great, deep understanding uh, of science. And it, we have somebody in the National Security Council and in the cabinet room who is a bona fide, very highly qualified, excellent scientist. So we are really fortunate to have that. And you see huge new budget initiatives. When did we ever see six billion for that, three billion for that, five billion for that? I mean, it is amazing the amount of new funding that's going into this. And hopefully that opens the doors, as Sputnik did, for a whole new generation of, of young people who are inspired to get into biomedical research. I hope I hope it does that. And we know that biomedical research is just one piece of it. He's also got a great interest in improving the National Science Foundation and expanding their budget, which also is much bigger than it used to be, which, which is a, a very good, good thing. And all those are good measures. You know, I was uh, listening to, uh, of all people last night, Adam Schiff, who's got a new book out. And it was very surprising after all the negatives that's come out to hear him be very positive. He said, I'm positive about this country because of all the people who stood up before my committee and took huge risks to do so. Yes, there are a bunch of scoundrels, but there are always scoundrels. But this country has people who are willing to stand up. And the same thing is true, in, I think, in our science. Yes, there are deep anti-scientific trends, but look at what we have built and what we are doing. 
you know, when I, you know, it is, it's just a joy to see what we're capable of in science today. When you look, and I'm reading some of these papers, I'm thinking, God almighty, all the work that went into this, this would have been 10 papers, 20 papers yeah. in my day, all crammed in yeah. to one, right? Because the tools are so powerful, right? It's a wonderful thing to see. You know, I, when I'm reading some of these papers, it's like walking through an exotic garden and seeing the most fabulous flowers you never even imagined to bloom. That's what going through and reading scientific literature is like today. Uh, for somebody who's you know, grown up in that whole process, going from when we were trying to figure out how the hell, yeah, I even remember when trying to figure out the genetic code. You know, I remember when people got the direction of reading messenger RNA backwards. Okay, there was, you know, it was good, fun times, but we had very basic understanding. Now we, now we know a lot, and it's, and I think we just see it accelerate. So that's all good. Well, Bill, uh, one of the major themes of this conference is health resilience, and we could make that specific to immune system resilience as a way of addressing future pandemics. What are your thoughts about? the sort of systemic interventions that can help to make our people healthier and presumably better to uh, better able to withstand. Uh, and, and that's their- a very interesting question. Can we strengthen immune systems? I think one emergent lesson is we'd like to be able to provide older people with the strength of an immune system that younger people have. But let me give you my analogy. I've My companies have gotten eight drugs on the market of one sort or another, companies I've started. Uh, I certainly can't take credit for all the work that hundreds of people did, but helped get these companies started. And my analogy for creating a new drug is, think of your, uh, in 1900, somebody gives you a television set that's on the fritz, and your solution is to throw things into the works and hope that it works better, okay? That's, you know, we're, we're dealing with a very complicated, machine, our bodies, and we know even now a small fraction of what we need to know. And we're throwing things in and hoping for the best. And we have a good reason to change this piece or that piece. But, you know, let me give you the example I was just thinking of. Yes, you would like to make the immune system stronger. And the thing, that, the one thing I can tell you this virus hates, because it's got about 20 different ways to turn it off, is interferon. It hates it. And it hates interferon responsive genes. Right? They tear it up. So it really tries its best. So you'd say, okay, let's give people interferon. Well, first of all, I developed a long acting interferon. I know it's not a great drug. It makes people feel like they've got the flu. Okay? Because that's why they feel so bad. They've got interferon. But the second thing is, what about all the feedback mechanisms and the fact that you're actually turning on ACE2 receptors in endothelial cells? So yeah, we should be able to do that. But we are a long shot. You mean, I remember the days when we didn't even know about the immunity. And Lawrence, that wasn't so long ago, right? That's right. Right? It wasn't so long ago when all of a sudden, you know, now we, there's two big parts of the immune system. And when I was doing my work, it was we were blind to that whole aspect of it. And so maybe we're still blind to a whole other set of things that we need to learn about. And so by... You're right, we need to strengthen it. We'd love to have old people have immunity as strong as young people. That would be a terrific solution to this particular problem Um, because our vaccines aren't really working that well. But let me just say something else about vaccines. We knew it. People who made mRNA vaccines knew they were short-lived. They knew it for Ebola. They knew it for cytomegalovirus. They knew they lasted three months. That's it. They knew that. Did they tell us that? No. The message that we got is if you're vaccinated, you're protected. Is that the message you have today? That was a mistake. It should have said, this is going to be like the flu. The vaccines can protect you for a while, as long as the virus is what it was before. But the, if you, the, the strength of the response will fade, and it won't work so much, we're going to have to continue. It looks like this is the first good step, but we're going to need other steps. That would have been a better message, and one that really focuses on what we knew 
And we didn't get that message. And the result is people are like confused. Well, it was going to protect me, but now it's not. Now I need a third dose, but I need a fourth. Can I mix this? Can I mix that? And so it's, a, it's a, as you know from yourself and your family, there's real confusion. And they're looking to you for the right answers. Right? They'd like to, they'd like to come to you, Larry, and say, Larry, tell me, I've had AstraZeneca, can I get or I've had John Chan Johnson, can I get Pfizer? How many people have asked you that question? Many people. I guess. Well, there, there, there's two answers. The one that uh, is totally data driven and the one that is based on best available knowledge. So uh, I think the circumstances dictate what kind of answer to give. And I think health authorities have different uh, missions, but they have to have some more consistent messaging uh, to face reality. It's a very difficult thing to, to get those messages right. And let's hope you know, and again, we are hearing from scientists. Is that who we really should be hearing from? That's a question I would ask. You know, when Rochelle Walensky says, I'm following the science, she's not following the science. She, you can't, because, you know, epidemiology, you might say is a science, but it's not a natural science. Anything that deals with the com total complexity of human society, it, we, you know, we're not Harry Seldon Jet. We don't have those equations. Okay, that we can predict human behaviors. And so it's much more, you know, the thing, the other general precept I operate on is humans are motive, uh, human behavior is determined by emotion, not by logic. And our logic fits our emotion and beliefs. We have belief and we have um, emotion, which, mo which determines our life. And our logic just accommodates those two things. And that's why science is so unusual, because it kind of force you into an unnatural situation where you're trying to use logic rather than the way your brain is actually built. Your brain is not built for that. You're built, most people's brains, the human brain is operates on emotion and belief rather than on logic. That's, it. that's what I think. Now, you may think well, differently, but I, think I, a, a I could to, not agree with you more, Bill and Larry. It's been my privilege to be part of this discussion and the hour has flown right by. Bill Heseltine, you are a, a national treasure. A globe oh, nice to say. Uh, it's just terrific to have you on. It, it, it's been such a great pleasure. Well, I want to thank Larry because Larry and I have been in correspondence and we got in correspondence, sure. you know, almost by chance, but I'm, Larry wrote me and said, I, I, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's been a real pleasure to have uh, Larry as a correspondent. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just been great for me. And I appreciate it. Well, my, my only two hopes are that uh, scientists will become rock stars someday. And maybe someday we'll not only have a scientist in the cabinet, we'll have a scientist as a president. Imagine that. <laughs> Well, Bill is a rock star, in my opinion. Oh, thank you. Uh, nice I hope it will be even more appreciated this time goes along. Bill, thank you, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Larry. And